is Brian Mohagi. I am the guide here at the Origin Center Museum. Uh, today we've come to see, experience and learn about who we are and where we come from. We have various uh, displays that explains different approaches to finding out what humanity is and where humanity originates from. So we are standing next to a world map which actually has Africa, the continent in the center of which uh, the museum uh, presents all of our information from an Africa-centric approach. So it also gives us a symbolic movement of the human ancestor from the south to the north and starts spreading all around the world. So most of the information that we talk about is more to do with how our human ancestor moved out from uh, what we now know as the cradle of humankind right up to the rest of the world. We are standing now on a display that gives us an idea of how the sciences, especially in archaeology and in different other fields, uh, have actually discovered very interesting artifacts that shows uh, how old is the oldest art which was found here in Southern Africa at Blombos. The chief uh, scientist that actually discovered this is Mr. Christopher Henshawood and he found a piece of ochre that had markings on them which symbolizes the earliest of the art and it also, he also found on the same layer uh, stone tools that shows uh, blade, blades, uh, arrowheads uh, and spearheads. He also found uh, a number of uh, marine shell beads that could have been used as ornaments at the time, whether worn by male or female. And all of these three shows how the early societies used to be that advanced, as we now know uh, how or when uh, markings or writing might have started from, and how the earliest of technologies in making of tools might have started from. Now we are talking uh, as far back as 75,000 years and in other cases a little earlier. The next uh, second oldest findings come from the continent of Asia, that means all of Asia, in this case they actually give us a picture of all of Asia. So with the dating you find that the grey area on this pillar shows us the earliest dates which nothing was found on it and from just the black area that is displayed on this pillar shows that uh, they also found the oldest uh, type of stone tool which is a chopper core just the same as the one found in Africa but a little bit later 2.25 million years and we can see also in the different layers as how the industries also started changing now on the third pillar we see Europe as I mentioned, the grey area shows some of the oldest times, but in Europe, the oldest stone tool is found at 1.8 million, and we can see also gradually how the stone tool advances right up to the modern time. We then move to America, which is one of the youngest in the findings, or what they term recent in the findings. The Americas show, both North and South show, quite the most youngest activities or rather earlier or most recent activities in the findings starting from 40,000 years in the evidence of human activity in that continent. All of these drawers also introduce us again to the bones also known as fossils so we come from the stones and then we also present the bones. So this is the paleontological study. From the archaeological study, we then move to the paleontological study. They are arranged in order of dates, showing the oldest of the, find, uh, of the findings at the bottom. Most popularly, we have Lucy, uh, which was found in Ethiopia, and um, it was discovered by Donald Johnson in 1974, and it actually at the time was uh, a very big mystery and an intriguing mystery because they only found a few uh, uh, fragments of the, the skull. 
and they had to recreate it. And when it was found in Africa, it actually created a stir at the time because a lot of the findings were known to be found in Europe, especially in relation to the oldest human. But again, we move on to another most popular find that came into South Africa, which is Mrs. Pless, which is one of the most intriguing and interesting uh, move when uh, Mrs. Pless was found, found in, um, in Stadfontein at the Cradle of Humankind in 1947 by Robert uh, Broome. Uh, and when Mrs. Pless was found, it actually changed the whole aspect of uh, the, uh, where the cradle is of the human ancestor. But it is not only uh, Mrs. Pless that changed uh, the outlook, but you also have the down skull that also had a replica of the, of the I mean, the copy of the, uh, of the brain that also changed not only the study of uh, the human uh, physiology in terms of the bones, but it also changed uh, the understanding of the human ancestor in terms of how we developed in terms of speech and also, if I may say, thinking at the time. And then we move uh, to the other most popular uh, fossil that was then uh, later found uh, in different other parts. You have other uh, uh, fossils that started being found in, in Europe, in Georgia. Um, Demanisi, the place is called Demanisi, dating around 1.75 million years, and that shows actually the movement out of Africa. You have what they call uh, hominids, species that were upright walking, that had started moving out of Africa. Of course, Mrs. Pless was also upright walking. And then you have another very intriguing uh, fossil that had changed everything of who we are, uh, starting with your uh, Neanderthal man that was found in Europe. And of course, this one was found in um, in France, and the most uh, uh, and others later were found in in Germany. But uh, the Neanderthal men uh, proved to be very closely related to Homo sapiens, which is our direct ancestor. And our direct ancestor, uh, Homo, Homo sapiens, the oldest having been found, or rather the one that we're we're having on display here, is found in Israel. So the Hominids uh, and Homo sapiens um, show actually how the human um, genetic pool had broken to upright walking Homo sapiens, direct ancestor of modern human, uh, from even um, your uh, Neanderthal man, from the Neanderthal man. The size of the skull, which are key areas which the paleontologists study, the size of the skull, the dentical makeup and also um, uh, the chin, the chin bone, uh, which is also very key to that, and also where the spine enters the base of the skull to determine whether they were upright or they were on all fours. But in the case of the Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, uh, the direction was clear on uh, who is our direct ancestor, which is Homo sapiens. Because of course, uh, we are known as Homo sapiens sapiens. We are now standing at uh, one of the displays that gives us a little bit of insight on genetics. So from the stones to the bones and then to the genes. It was actually discovered that uh, the oldest mitochondrial DNA is discovered here. Uh, it, it is discovered here in Southern Africa having the oldest of the mitochondrial DNA uh, maternal lineage. So, uh, with that, they discovered that the oldest dates from around 150,000 and 200,000 years. And it actually changed uh, the perception of uh, whether the bones or the stones are the only evidence that we have. Because with the mitochondrial DNA, which represents the current technology, also gives us insight on who the oldest uh, or where the oldest human ancestor might have originated from. So on this display, we also have a very inter uh, interesting and intriguing find of stone tool technology. Uh, these were found to be most recent from around 20,000 to 10,000 to the recent time now. 
in archaeology, uh, 10,000 years seems like a very small uh, age or, or very recent age as they, they place it. But this also shows how advanced the stone technology used by the ancestors of the sand people had actually really advanced where you have uh, bladelets, where you have um, bladelets like those where you have scrapers and where you have also some of the rocks on which some of the platelets are removed from. And uh, what they might have used them for would have been surgical cutting of certain aspects of either the human body or an animal on which uh, the platelets were used on. The sand people of today are known to be uh, descendants of the earlier inhabitants of Southern Africa. All of the sand people in Southern Africa uh, actually people that have been here much earlier than any other group that is known from the Zulus to the Sutus or any other group. But uh, they are known to have occupied areas such as Namibia, Angola, Botswana and of course uh, what is South Africa today. And of course they, call, they don't call themselves Sen, uh, they call themselves in the names of the groups that they belong to. You have the Kham, you have the Jinkwa, you have the Ku. Uh, you have the Nama, uh, you have the Kwe, and you have many other groups among the Sen, which are the ones who are known to have left behind, I mean the ancestors of the Sen had left behind very intriguing uh, rock engravings that we will see as we go through, and that have left us with a lot of knowledge in relation to the landscape and uh, who they are and how they used to live before, of which is what the museum represents as well. So as we walk through the corridor, we call this the same corridor, we are first introduced to the role of the women within the organization of the groups of the same. And digging sticks are some of the tools that they use for digging roots and uh, they are known also to collect ostrich egg shells which uh, they actually uh, collect water in and of course all of the eggshells are also later used when broken as um, um, material to make beads and other um, ornaments are, are along their dresses made out of skin. So not only is the role of the women gathering, but men are hunters. And men as hunters are known to use tools such as bow and arrow. And uh, very intriguing is that their technology of bow and arrow was very sophisticated in terms of how the arrow was uh, designed. You have the uh, uh, poisonous point, you have your link shaft, and you have your flight shaft. And that's what was very intriguing with the findings from the archaeologists. So uh, before it was believed that the sand were primitive, only to discover that their knowledge of the landscape, the knowledge of the animals they hunt, and the knowledge of the role of men uh, and the role of women is very clearly defined within their society. So we also know that the sand was so advanced in this sense that they also buried their dead. And a lot of burials were discovered in the Cape along the coastline, uh, from along the coast going to the Eastern Cape, where huge numbers of graves were found. And of course, this is one of the replicas of a grave of a child. And uh, with this grave, a lot of other aspects that shows um, advancement. They found plants in the grave. Um, they, f they found um, uh, shells in the grave. They also found quite a number of other aspects, such as if it was a woman, they would find a, a, a board stone. Um, and if it was a man, they would find a, an arrow point. But in this case, they found a lot of shells and they found that the bones represented those of a child. And uh, with that, it shows how advanced the same were in terms of respecting both life and respecting the dead. The other very popular figure that we know is uh, Sarki Bartman. So Sarki Bartman belonged to one of the same communities, the Hrikwa community in particular. And uh, Sarki Bartman is known to have been taken in the early nine, um, 1820s to be uh, exhibited in Europe and uh, her name or rather her position 
uh, within the history of the cell is very much uh, moving in the sense that uh, she was later not only exhibited, but when she passed away, her body was uh, uh, cut into different pieces for further exhibition after even when she had died. And uh, from England, she was earlier sold uh, to France, where a very well-known uh, paleontologist known as Georges Cuvier dissected her body into those parts, placed them into bottle jars and displayed them for over 150 years. And in the early 70s, uh, the French government then decided that that display should actually rather be closed because it dehumanized not only uh, um, Sarki Bartman as a human, but also it actually gives a very bad reputation to the French people. And therefore, in 2002, um, her body was then brought back to Southern Africa after obviously a lot of negotiations with the government and she was then uh, buried properly in her hometown of Khrikwa, that is in the Western Cape. This is an eland. The eland is a sacred animal to the sand people. And uh, the sand believe that not only is the eland sacred to them, but it was the most favorite animal uh, of God. And God used to feed it honey and sometimes rub some of the honey on the fur. That's why it looks the golden brown. Now, the sand also hunts the eland for food and uh, they also hunt it for the skins. That means the food would be the meat. They hunt it for the skins. They hunt it for the horns. They hunt it for the bones to make some of the tools that they use. And they also hunt it more importantly for the spirit. They believe that God had inserted a special spirit inside the eland, which is known as Nun. And Nun or Tay is actually the spirit that the sand medicine man harness when they actually uh, um, kill the eland. And as it dies, it dies in the posture in which the animal is placed on this display. So they believe that the way it is postured here, or the way it dies, is uh, signatory to how the medicine man will enter into the spirit world. So how the medicine man enters into the spirit world is exactly on what is seen on a lot of the paintings of the sand. In particular, in this case, symbolically, the eland is the spiritual symbol of how medicine man enters into the spirit world. So the next display gives us a picture of how an eland is dying and showing also how medicine men are also showing uh, how they enter into the spirit world. Now, in a lot of these displays, especially this one, which was done by uh, Stephen Townley Bassett, gives us a very good idea on how uh, medicine men travel and enter into the spirit world. And Eland is symbolic very much on how uh, medicine men are into the spirit world and how they harness that spirit, those lines that we see on uh, entering on the head of one of the medicine men is the moon or the clay that the medicine men say actually enters their body and they are able to can travel in and out of these spirit worlds. How they travel is also seen symbolically with the weaving of the thread of light. Now the light that we see is known as the thread of light on which medicine men travel on into the spirit world and out of the spirit world. So this display gives us also how paintings are done. A lot of the paintings are actually uh, uh, use a lot of first Ilan blood which is very key in a lot of the paintings and that's what scientists have discovered in a huge amount of the earliest paintings of sand. Now they found a lot of Ilan blood. In some paintings they would find also uh, white um, being done using ostrich eggshell, burnt ostrich eggshell and they would find uh, the yellow uh, using yellow ochre, uh, brown ochre or either red ochre in a lot of the cases. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that scientists actually remove very lightly to try and understand what type of materials were used for making the paintings. So you have your ostrich egg shells, uh, burnt ostrich egg shells, you have your charcoal, you have your elan blood, and 
you sometimes have gall or many other um, uh, other types of material. In some cases, they even say bird droppings are sometimes found on, on some of the paintings. We have a wall that also gives us uh, another aspect of how the information was collected. Uh, we have names such as Kabo, we have names such as uh, Valen Bleak, who was a linguist. We have Kabo as a medicine man. We have uh, Professor David Lewis Williams, who is also one of the um, founding fathers of the Rock Art Research Institution. And we have uh, Tan Kaso, uh, also being one of the informants. So we have actually 